Hello, Mark. Joe, how are you? I'm, you know, I'm the usual. The usual? It's, You're very yeah. steady state, man. Well, you know. I have a question, of course. What was uh, one of your favorite bands when you were a kid? Well, of course, the obvious answer is the band that we're going to talk about today. And uh, okay. I did, I had a lot of affection for them. But when I was a kid, me and the gang, we loved Genesis and uh, progressive rock and stuff like okay, that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, we would drive around listening to Genesis. And uh, and then eventually, I had the opportunity to to meet those guys. And that was fantastic and tell them how much I loved their music. So, Oh, you got yeah. to meet Genesis? Yeah, I got to meet uh, Phil Collins and uh, Tony Banks and Rutherford. And, yeah, and it was because uh, I, did, I didn't normally do that in my day job, the fanboy thing. Right. But with them, I had to make an exception. They were in the studio. <laughs> I set them up. And uh, and then I said, listen, guys, I got to tell you, I love your music. I listen to it all the time. I grew up with it. And, and they were all like, wow, that's amazing. Thanks, man. As if they'd never heard that a thousand times before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your chance to say it, though. So you had to take yeah. it. It was a good moment. What about you? Uh, well, if we're talking about the same era, like sort of teenage years, I got to say Bruce Springsteen in the E Street Band. That was... That was our guy. Okay. Yeah. He was singing our anthems. And maybe Brian Adams at the same time. Like it was like between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent choices. And so we should uh, ask our, our guest, uh, Teresa Elfeld. What about you? I mean, are you going to tell us what the, the obvious answer for you or? I mean, I guess the obvious answer would be Doug and the Slugs. But <laughs> as an actual child, that's not correct. As a young person, my favorite artist, hands down, was Michael Jackson, because I was totally out of step. You know, I discovered him when I was about 12 or 13, and this was in the early 2000s. He was not cool or popular or someone that anyone was listening to at this uh, juncture, at least in my age group. But um, I, I can't remember how he uh, appeared in my life, but I was obsessed for a very long period of time, so much so that I would learn like classical adaptations of his music to perform in piano recitals um, as I advanced in the wow. story. I was a huge nerd and that's something I'm happy to chat about as we, uh, <laughs> as we spend time together today. But, but could you moonwalk? That's my next question. <laughs> I, I think I had a serviceable moonwalk, you know, I wouldn't say it was uh, spectacular, but it got the job done. Nice. Mm, Good for okay, you. Now I regret that we were not doing video here. So <laughs> yeah. Although we could pretend it. Oh, look at her. She's, that's, wow, very impressive. Wow, look at, that's actually a pretty good moonwalk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any particular album or song of his? Or? Oh my gosh, that, okay, we're going to be here for several hours if you ask me that. I think <laughs> okay. when I was, when I was younger and first discovered him, it was probably somewhere between just Thriller and Bad, although I loved Dangerous later on when I got a little bit older. So those three albums would be the ones I'd cycle through the wall. I also loved his work with the Jackson specifically, not the Jackson 5. Huh. There's a personnel change. So you might know a label change and then they they perform as um, somewhat awkward uh, older teens and, and men in their 20s. But they had some really cool stuff right before he launched, but so many great albums. Yeah, I don't know how many of them were produced by Quincy Jones, but I mean, just I right there. That question, because again, I was a super fan. Uh, so he produced Off the Wall, Thriller, and Bad. Um, Off the Wall, also obviously a, a stellar album. So those were really, uh, you know, some of his best work. Then Michael started working with other producers, and by the mid '90s, things really crashed. We're going to pretend that chunk of time didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Okay, we're going to yeah. have to have you back actually and, and talk about Michael, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, come on! Yeah, uh, we're here to talk about somebody else today. But before we do that, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Teresa Elfeld. I'm a documentary filmmaker out of Vancouver, BC. I've had the pleasure of doing two feature documentaries in the last few years, um, as well as a collection of shorts, both documentary and scripted. My first film uh, was The Rankin File, Legacy of a Radical, which chronicled uh, the story of Vancouver politician Harry Rankin. Uh, it was uh, produced by my producer, John Bolton, who also produced my second feature documentary, Doug and the Slugs of Me, which is the film that I think we're going to be chatting a bit about today. On that note, let me just say that, first of all, when I first became aware of the existence of such a film, I was already really happy about that because for years I'd been wondering, why is nobody talking and writing about Doug and the Slugs? Because I thought that they were a quintessential Canadian band before 
you know, long before the tragically hip and, and, and blue rodeo That's... and bands like that. So, and then I set aside time to watch your documentary on, on CBC gem. And, uh, and I was not disappointed at all. I was, uh, um, not that I thought I would be, but I, I just, I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was personal. It was entertaining. It was informative. And I knew that I had to go to Mark and say, we need to invite Teresa to the podcast if we can, <laughs> if we can get her. So I'm thrilled that you're here to talk to us about this. Well, it's my and pleasure. Thank you. I was disappointed, but with Jim, not the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it was very challenging <laughs> to watch so cuz they throw in a lot of ads and it, oh, it yeah. Let me do let me do my public service work for the CBC and say yeah. there is a premium version of Gem. It's as cheap as like a dollar a month on promotion. I would pay for that 100%. Yeah, and it's about 6 bucks a month but then you can watch the film without ads. A little easier for 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 Cuz it kicked me out on the ad breaks at least twice. But the thing was I love the documentary. It was so well done. Um, oh, and you. you didn't mention in your bio there that you're from Vancouver and you lived next to Doug Bennett. And his his, his daughter was your and best his friend. His daughter yeah. was your best friend. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously that's a, a, a story chapter that we cover in the film. But you know, you asked me off the top of the chat, you know, sort of assuming that my favorite band as a child was Doug and the Slugs, but that's not true. I didn't I didn't really know who Doug and the Slugs were. I, I was too young and, and, and the band's heyday had, you know, gently concluded. Yeah. And so to me, you know, Doug was just Shay's dad and I knew, I did know he was in a band. I did see them perform. I feel like maybe once or twice as a very young child, but I didn't appreciate the scope and the magnitude of their career in their heyday, nor did I appreciate the music beyond, uh, you know, I did know the big hits because we would still hear, too bad and making it work on on golden oldies which was always playing in my house but in any event <laughs> no i had no clue um really about about the band until uh, much later in my life and then how did you become aware and then how did that feel kind of making that connection it was a really <laughs> interesting and, and strange process i was actually in the middle of making my first feature documentary, the the film about Harry Rankin. And I was looking for some music to use in the film and I wanted something. That film was really set in 1986 Vancouver. It uses uh, a wealth of um, beautiful archival footage um, that another filmmaker shot at the time. So it's a film really, really set in, in mid eighties Vancouver. And I was trying to think, I want some music that reflects the vibrancy of, of that era post expo, uh, the quirky underdog vibe of Vancouver, all of those things. And I don't want, you know, just my choices. I don't typically like to just score um, documentaries. I love to use existing music when I can. And I was literally at that time in my life living back at my mom's house after a recent move from uh, Victoria where we'd been living. And my home office at the time was one of the bedrooms upstairs. And I remember just sitting there as thinking, thinking, thinking. And I literally spun in my chair and I looked over and the Bennett house was there. And obviously, uh, no, no Bennett's lived there at this time. But I just thought, oh, Doug and the Slugs, huh? Haven't listened to them in a while. I haven't really thought of them in a while. I wonder, I wonder what could happen there. And so I just started listening to the music. This was before the band, bless them, had put everything on Spotify and YouTube. So it was really like just putting my order in uh, and going to the record shops to start collecting all their their LPs. And it was such an absolute shock to hear this music beyond those big hits. Because again, yes, I know Too Bad and yes, I know Making It Work and they're wonderful songs, but... I started listening to I, 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 the full albums and some of the deeper cuts, and it was just so much richer, both musically mm -hmm. and lyrically than I ever expected, that I got really hooked. And so from there, I made the choice to only use Doug and the Slugs music in that first feature film. We got a really positive response to the, the, the soundtrack, and that led my producer, John Bolton, and I to be like, oh... Doug and the Slugs, right? There's probably a story there. Let's let's see let's see what we can do with that idea. And here we are. And it's a it's a great story too. Like it's it's really personal and lovely. But I think we should take it a step back. We should probably talk about who Doug and the Slugs were. I mean, Joe and I are Canadian mm -hmm. and of a certain vintage, so we know very well who Doug and the Slugs were. But but could you describe for our other listeners who aren't necessarily Canadian or of a certain age? <laughs> my generation, you know, my yeah. generation 
isn't super familiar with Doug and the Slugs, but as I told folks that I was working on the film, if I told someone of my generation, usually the response was, oh, my parents love Doug and the Slugs. <laughs> they saw the Commodore in 81. And I'm like, that's wonderful. You should go listen to the music now too. But um, anyways, Doug and the Slugs is a wonderful, you know, we call them the iconic Canadian party band. Um, they were formed in Vancouver in 1977 uh, by Doug Bennett and John Burton. They built a reputation for playing um, their own hosted shows um, at ethnic halls around Vancouver. Doug Bennett was not a musician by trade. He actually came from a marketing background. He'd worked in advertisement. And he managed to build a real buzz around the band. And from there, um, after a personnel change, they really took off in 1979 with their first uh, single, Too Bad. They had a number of uh, gold records. They did extremely well uh, in Canada. I've mentioned the songs Too Bad and, and Making It Work. Also, uh, Day by Day, uh, Tom mm-hmm. Pettrell, huge hits. Yeah. Um, I couldn't give, uh, I couldn't say what genre Doug and the Slugs are. No one can say really what genre <laughs> they are. They're sort of new wave ish, R and B ish, constantly pulling from different genres. And yes, the band uh, not only succeeded with their their music, but also they were real pioneers of of the music video format, with Doug Bennett writing and directing their early videos. And they were one of the first bands actually shown on MTV in the very, mm-hmm. very early days. So they're an incredibly important band. Uh, they sort of, uh, things ended uh, in the early 90s, but they've left just this incredible catalog of music and one that I'm really hoping that folks who see the film get to rediscover uh, just like I, I did um, when I started this project. Well, and you really, really fleshed out their story because, you know, when I had gone looking for information about them before you came along, all I was ever really able to find out was that Doug Bennett was, he was described as a businessman who decided to start his own band and, and then he passed away tragically at a very young age. And it wasn't really clear why, just it suggested that maybe it had something to do with his grueling touring schedule or something. And then in your documentary, you flesh out that whole story from a personal angle. And it's kind of even sadder than, than I had oh, yeah, been aware of. Yeah. The information that you provided lended more gravitas to songs like Day by Day, you know, and mm-hmm. certain lyrics in Day by Day talking. I don't know if there is a connection, but it sounds like he's talking about his feelings and how he's feeling about his life. And Doug was a real poet. And I, I really felt one of the first strong feelings I had when I was developing the film was I, I, I now that I know how rich the music is, and again, we're talking about Doug from the lyrical end, but also the band members too, you know, Simon Kendall and John Burton specifically were instrumental in, in coming up with the arrangements and the instrumentation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the tracks beyond those big hits are just fascinating. You know, day by day, you mentioned um, my favorite song, which is is highlighted quite a bit in the documentaries, partly of From Pressure, not one that ever got much radio play or that um, many even fans are familiar with. But mm-hmm. the guys just, you know, while on the outside, they had this um, this this image of fun, of goofiness, of irreverence and wackiness and uh, sardonic humor. There was some real uh, rich and complex ideas being contemplated and expressed uh, musically and lyrically, and that's really what what got me hooked. I loved in your documentary how um, you started with his really beginning points of getting into the music business, which was working for the Georgia Strait. And I'm like, so wait a minute, get me this straight. Doug was f- friends with Bob Geldof, and my second question was. Why the hell was Bob Geldof working at the Georgia Strait? Did you ever get an answer for that? It's like it was like what? <laughs> this Irish um, kids living in Vancouver working for this little arts paper. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I certainly can answer that. So for those of you who haven't seen the film, yes, I I was lucky enough to interview Sir Bob Geldof um, uh, near his home in London, and so obviously yes, it was important to make sure I understood the full story from. Yeah. Um, who knew it. And so 
Sir Bob, who was just Bob at the time, um, had come <laughs> to the uh, looking for a break because he had, um, you know, begun his career in, in, in Ireland, but he'd come to BC and he wanted to work in resources. He wanted to do something totally different. And my understanding is that he started, I believe it was in logging or it was in something resource oriented, again, looking for a total break and something different. But that hadn't quite panned out. And so he ended up in Vancouver and started writing. Uh, and again, I could be slightly wrong here, but I believe he started writing spec reviews for right. the Georgia Strait, and then they ended up hiring him. And so, yes, he was he was friends with with Doug um, through their shared time at that very radical and very important and significant newspaper. Mm -hmm. And it very. was just wild. You know, one of my first clues to that relationship not only was the band sharing that Bob Geldof had reached out when Doug died to offer his condolences. But more excitingly for me was actually seeing his name, as well as a number of other really interesting names in Doug's journal, when he was reflecting on significant relationships and periods of his life and describing hanging out with with Bob. And this this was him writing in the early 80s, looking back, you know, right. seven, 10 years um, and sort of, you know, just having a moment thinking about how far the Boomtown Rats had gone. Uh, this is before Live Aid and, and Bob really taking yeah. off. Yeah. And um and him, you know, contemplating his own success at that point. So it was a real trip, really fun. Wow. I'm just imagining Bob Geldof watching Michael Palin and Monty Python in the Lumberjack song going, Yes, that's it for me. I want to be a lumberjack in BC. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to BC. No, I know I, I might have the actual craft wrong, but I, I I seem to recall it was something in um, something in outdoor resources. And I, I I have a follow up question to that. Not not more silliness. Sorry. I know we, we probably should have said spoiler alert for the documentary at the very start because we're, I have questions. So there's this moment when you appear on screen with this box of spiral bound notebooks that. Doug Bennett made apparently every day of his life, he made a journal entry. What was that like as a documentary maker that moment? Was it just, was it completely overwhelming or were you just so excited that you had this resource at your hands? Like, or was it a combination of both of those things? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I definitely say getting the journals was a combination of both. I didn't get them all right at the beginning. Um, I had a couple teas first before I finally got the collection. And, you know, if I can, if I can define one commonality with my two feature films and really with my career in general, I'd say I've been really lucky, really, really lucky in that uh, getting Doug Bennett's journals was one of those cases. I mean, mm -hmm. I looked at them and I'm a journaler myself. So right away I, I felt a kinship with Doug and this was very early in the process. So we actually didn't have any funding. We didn't, it, this was just John Bolton and, and myself at this point. We had very few people on board other than the band and, and the family's participation. And so it was really a, a period of months of me just reading these books. And I had, wow. I was actually traveling a little bit that year and I took them with me uh, nervously sealed in multiple Ziploc bags um, to different countries and would read them um, as I, as I went. And it was just, you know, it was a real, I don't even know what the word is. It was, it, it was transcendent, you know, to be able to go into someone's mind um, like that. And it was, I will say, it was confirmed to me by by Nancy, Doug's widow, by John and Simon from the band, that Doug had been planning to write a memoir and that these books had been key for that. Uh, right. I, 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 uh, yes, of course, I felt some apprehension when I first got them. Should I be reading these? Do I have a right to read these? What responsibility will I carry once I have read them? But Doug's writing style really supported that. They begin in 1980, just after Too Bad is taken off. And they, they feel like a man chronicling his journey to doing something, something great. So I eventually settled into to a, a degree of comfort in reading them. And really, they were uh, a revelation. I appreciate that answer because it's it's very honest, and I, yeah, because I think I would feel that apprehension if some if I had like somebody's life in my hands like that. My my thought was when I saw that is like that's such an incredible gift 
for what you're trying to accomplish in this documentary. But at the same time, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, I'll just clarify, they weren't exactly daily entries. They were daily entries, usually when he was on tour. Oh, okay. They they were far more um, consistent when he was on tour. And that really was the bulk of of his writing, was the touring process, was the recording um, of his albums, working through lyrics and such. Um, But there certainly could be gaps. um, And that's true of my journals too. So, but really to step back and look at the, the amount. So it was 39 journals written from 1980 to 1989. So he starts them in his late 20s and and ends them a decade after. I mean, I'm sure we can all reflect on the amount of growth that takes place in those 10 years. It's enormous. And oh, wow. it's, yeah. it, was, it was just a, an absolute trip. Stepping back even further, growing up next to him, you didn't know really who he was or what he did. How much interaction did you actually have with, with Doug Bennett? Oh, I, I had tons of interaction with Doug Bennett, but again, he was my best friend's dad. He was a very hands-on dad. He was incredibly present, you know, especially considering he didn't, you know, go to the office at a nine to five job. When he was there, he he was there. You know, hmm. he was always in the kitchen cooking. Uh, he hosted parties all of the time that I was welcome to come to. This was uh, especially exciting for me as I was the only child uh, or am the only child of two older parents. And so my house was very quiet and very organized and fun and great. But the Bennett house was this absolute vibrant chaos. And Doug, again, like my, my first memories are of Doug or of him putting a Thanksgiving turkey on his head and chasing us girls in the <laughs> yard. You know? Or it was making fart jokes or, you know, just, again, he was this big, goofy, larger-than-life neighborhood dad. And so I felt like I knew him. I just had no clue yeah. who he was, you know, two decades before. That persona jobs with the stage persona yeah, that I saw. Yeah, that's the stage was, persona, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. fortunate enough to yeah. see him uh, at least twice that I recall. Yeah. Me too. And uh, and he was always making wise cracks and, you know, yeah. and at one point, and this is a part of the reason I guess I feel like I have a tiny little bit of a personal connection with the band. I saw them at uh, the Forum in Ontario Place. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, yep. Uh, and I'm not a particularly demonstrative person, you know, but I, I'm thoroughly enjoying the music, but probably not showing it overtly. And Doug looked out into the audience and pointed. And I realized he was pointing at me. <laughs> and so I pointed at myself and I'm like, and then he nodded. He's like, yes, yes, you, you know? And then he mimed clapping, you know? <laughs> I'm like, come on, man, get into it. So I did. <laughs> that's and I just got such a kick out of that. That's, that's, I, cause that's one of my memories. So uh, he was huge in the Queens players. I was, I was a Queens player when I went to university and um, we used a bunch of his songs in our cabarets, like <laughs> almost like every cabaret I was in, we had at least one Doug and the Slugs song. And he came to Kingston a couple of times and <laughs> same story. It wasn't me though. It was, it was my friend, Dave Lurie and Dave okay. Lurie and uh, uh, Andrew Hyatt were singing along and he invited them up on stage <laughs> yeah. and they sang backups, I think on too bad. It might've been. Uh, two yeah. songs and then oh, I got wow. to do two numbers before they got kicked off. Yeah. Yeah. He was, oh, he was cool. big in our group. Like we loved him. And I think it was the mixture of musicality. The fact that there was multi-part vocals mm-hmm. for Queens players, especially because we, that's what we did. And um, I just, yeah. Listening to his music today. Cause I knew I was going to be talking to you. I was like, well, I guess it's a Doug of the slugs day. And it, yeah, <laughs> you're right about the music. There's just some great, lyrics that are deep yeah Yeah. they're really amazing his songwriting is really amazing and there's an element of you know again a spoiler alert but i mean there's (laughs) more than an element i guess of tragedy you know to the yeah to your documentary and to his story and i'd always felt that knowing that he died at such a young age and how old was he He was in his 50s right yeah he was um 52 just about to turn just two weeks shy of his 53rd birthday yeah, and then that coupled with, I mean, he wanted the band to be a huge success, and it achieved a certain level of success. Didn't break out uh, really in the United States or anywhere else in the world, so it never quite achieved the success I think that he had hoped for, but okay. kind of kept chasing, right? 
Yeah, you know, I th- I really love Sam Feldman's line early in the film. Sam yeah. Feldman was his manager um, and, and good friend for a long time. You know, Doug's dream was world domination. And <laughs> yeah. I think that's true. And I actually think that Doug's dream of world domination preceded him entering music. I think that it was a focus and a drive and a, a curiosity that I, I got the sense from interviewing family and friends originated very young. And Doug actually, you know, didn't intend to go into music as, as you might understand now from knowing how latent that he'd already had a career, but he wanted to be a filmmaker and he wanted to go to film school and he almost did. There was unfortunately a, a hiccup with his, his school financing, but I think that to have that drive and that ambition on the one hand is fantastic because it got them where where they went. I mean, I know mm-hmm. again not only from from interviewing his his bandmates and family and friends, but from the journals, just how dedicated he was and how hard he worked to getting the band on the map. So on the one hand, it was a blessing because it really got them to to you know into the, the stratosphere at least in Canadian standards. But the 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 other side of that coin is that he could never be happy with what he had. And so yeah. I think a lot of folks would look at the success, again, the gold albums, the the Juno wins um, and nominations, and um, just the the reaching that degree of of adoration and say, okay, I did it. You know, I think for people who have that that insatiable drive like Doug, it's it's still not enough, and so the fact that they never did successfully break into the U.S. they did they do have a pocket of support in Australia, but um, despite really concerted efforts, they couldn't break the states. I think that really hurt. And worse, then things started to be stripped away. You know what success they had kind of petered out, and then his marriage uh, that didn't work out, and it must have been just increasingly painful for him. I, I can't imagine. And, you know, I'll say Doug stopped writing in 1989. So I, I don't have access to his inner thoughts from his, his, uh, the latter part of his life. I, I knew him well in the late 90s. But after he uh, left the house, um, I, I certainly was out of touch. I, I had changed schools as well. So I was no longer in touch with Shay. But I, I can't imagine how, how difficult that was. He worked so hard for so long. And I think, you know, one, one consistent piece that a lot of his friends said was that Doug would give you the shirt off his back. He would do anything he could for his friends, but he could never ask for help. Hmm. That really, Hmm. that really struck me and, and jived with the story as I came to know it. Now this, and I want to ask you about, cause you're in the arts, you're making documentaries and films, presumably with some aspirations of, even greater things, sure. and uh, yeah, and Mark and I are uh, are writers, you know, waiting for our careers to turn into something resembling J.K. Rowling's. <laughs> <You know? laughs> wow, <laughs> as long yeah. as I don't but, follow the same arc, uh, I'm yeah. okay. At, at some point, you kind of reconcile yourself with it's the process, and you're enjoying the process. And sure, if there's like fame and fortune and whatnot, great. But I think we have a healthy relationship with that ambition. How does it relate to your career and your life and your work, that idea? <laughs> yeah, there's Ooh. a heavy question. Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. Joe. You know, I love that. That's great. Because that's <laughs> what I was thinking the same thing, because there's two prongs to the narrative in your in your film, which I really identified, which which is the it's the I don't want to say hubris, but like the goal of of you know conquering America, say for example, as a rock star. Mm. And yeah. then the tragedy of not being able to succeed at that at the same time. And then what you give up along the way. And I think for you in in the film, one of the things that's nice about the film is that you come to the realization that you didn't lose your friendship with Shay. It just yeah. wasn't the same for a while. Yeah. And so I guess my question is, yeah, how do those things all fit together in your head? Mm. Oh my gosh. Um, it's a hard question. <laughs> no, 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 no. And it's, it's a good one. And it's one that honestly, you know, one of the first things that, that, that attracted me to Doug's journals outside of the insight and the, the, the intimacy of, of being in his head, but you know, he was describing the, the, the path of, of an artist trying to fulfill his dreams and 
without comparing myself to, to Doug and, and the massive success that he achieved, I really identified with that. And, you know, I was actually of a similar ish age, a little bit older uh, than he was when he started writing um, and was in almost a similar place in my life. There's a lot of commonalities. I came to film to documentary specifically late in life. And, and so it was fascinating to me to sort of chart how he set his goals and his dreams and, and work towards them and what it felt like when he started hitting them, you know, like those early entries, the, the degree of excitement is just palpable. You know, he writes about the first time he played the Elma Combo in Toronto hmm. and then a year later, the bottom line in New York and, you know, going back to Elma Combo, the first autograph he signed and all these pieces. And I was reading it like, Oh my gosh, like, I, I can feel that with you again now as an artist in a very different uh, genre. Um, I certainly <laughs> um, haven't um, and, and success in my field looks very different than what it does for Doug. But I understand that that moment of hitting those first, you know, milestones and those first pieces that you're seeking um, certainly for me with my first film. But I think similarly to Doug, the ceiling just raises, <laughs> you know, yeah. you hit, you hit what you thought would be enough. And you're like, Oh, that was great. Let's do bigger next time. Now I want this. And now the ceiling gets higher and what satisfied you, you know, five years ago now leaves you cold. And so I think that the, you know, one thing I've taken from, from the story and, and also talking to the band members too, to Simon and John and uh, Richard and Steve and Wally is, you know, it's a, you have to do work to sort of re reevaluate and uh, recalibrate, I think, especially when things start trending um, a direction that you don't like. And mm. I, you know, I really rely on my family and friends to, uh, and again, I just want to be very clear. I'm certainly not comparing my career to Doug and the <laughs> no. I'm a very small little doc filmmaker in, in, in Vancouver that no one cares about, but when, you know, I, I, I do rely on my family and friends to help check me when my head gets too big and I start no longer being content. Like my husband's really good at kind of checking me like, hey, you know, you know, this much has happened in the last few years. Be proud of that before you get pissed off that you're not in L.A., you know, making a 20 million dollar Marvel film. Not that that's what hmm. I have want to do. 20 million, sorry, 20 billion. Uh, <laughs> not that that's what I want to do, but you know, I really think it's something, it's an ongoing process for anyone who works into the, in the arts to constantly recalibrate and, and think about where they're going. Yeah. In a healthy way. Yeah. Healthy way. That's the yeah. key. Yeah. And okay. So what, just to ask the question explicitly, what does success look like for you? <laughs> well, you know, I think, like I said, I'm, I'm sort of late to documentary filmmaking. I only started doing that in 2018, really, um, as a, as a, as a full-time vocation. And I had had a couple other careers prior, you know, I did go to film school. Simon I, Fraser, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. I went to SFU, yeah. I graduated from SFU in 2010, moved my little butt to Toronto with all my hopes and dreams of being a, a narrative filmmaker. And you know, made a whole bunch of little, little tiny shorts and I had some success, but after a few years, it just wasn't going where I thought it was going to go. And I got really burned out. And so when I was 25, I thought, you know what? Life's too short. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so I gave myself permission just to quit. And I went and did my, I pulled a 180, moved to Victoria, did a master's in dispute resolution and worked in a very different capacity for a few years um, until I got sucked into doing the rank and file um, through uh, a bit of a happy accident. Um, so to answer your question, again, I'm, I'm sort of new to documentary. I've been very lucky. Um, and my, my first two films have done uh, reasonably well. The second, much more so than the first. And so success, I, I, I don't know exactly. I think it's continuing to do something that I feel compelled and curious and, and excited about doing. Um, but at the same time, and I really took this from making the last film, balancing it with life being short and health being important and family and friends and enjoyment being important and to constantly be making sure that things are in balance. Yes, I want to keep growing and making bigger films with more money. And, and again, I am moving into narrative filmmaking finally, um, which is great, but always tempering it with, you know, how do I want my days to go? 
do I want to see my family and friends? Do yeah. I want to sleep okay? <laughs> do I want to make sure I don't have a substance use issue? You know, it's so it's just mm. I think it's that it's making sure that I'm moving forward and getting bigger and more sustainable while also um, staying healthy and happy. It's a great answer. Yeah, that's, and that's I, a fabulous answer. It's a better answer well, than I could I give. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I ask it because it's just. I think it's a, such an important question. I know it's a question that I ask myself. You know, we, we know a lot of writers, a lot of aspiring writers, a lot of accomplished writers, but who have not hit that kind of success. You know, my sister's a filmmaker, and I know she's kind of the, I mean, we're kind of clones in a way. Yeah, will we ever hit that? You know, even with this podcast, like Mark and I talk about, what do we want to get out of the podcast? We want, you know, like 50,000 downloads, or do we just want to enjoy talking to people like yourself. And I think that's where we've landed because we really love talking, you know, and, and we're thrilled mm. that, that people like you agree to come on the podcast and, you know, which surely is a pinnacle of success for you. It's all downhill from, from here. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Will this be even mentioned in your journal? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's great. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring this up just because I have to, you know, because we're talking about documentary, at least for me specifically. And one of the reasons I, I keep saying I'm moving into narrative and scripted directing is that documentary in Canada is and globally is not sustainable. I just read a variety article that came out of IDFA, the big uh, documentary festival in, in Europe, where they, they were discussing a report about how documentary filmmakers cannot, I believe like the, the stats of how many can actually maintain a, a, a sustainable income right. with documentary filmmaking is just paltry. It's absolutely paltry. And so I think in Canada, like to answer that question more pointedly, success is just simply paying your rent on time. Yeah. <laughs> in documentary, it's an absolutely unsustainable and very difficult and crowded field. And I've been very lucky. Um, my, my entire career is just marked by luck and being in the right place at the right time and working with fantastic people. Again, I keep bringing up John Bolton, who produced both of these films. Um, that relationship has been key. And so when I'm looking to the future and where I'm trying to go, it's absolutely out of documentary. I'm, I'm not I'm shy or quiet about talking about that because in this country, it is not a sustainable option. Hmm. And and yet, wasn't the documentary form pioneered by Canadians? Wasn't it John Grierson? <laughs> oh, very much. I mean, we can go back yeah. to Flaherty uh, in the um, beginning of the last century. Absolutely. And I think, you know, many people describe now as being the golden age of documentary, which is great. You know, we're seeing um, a renewed interest in the format. We're seeing a lot of hybrid and different approaches to the genre and we're seeing, yeah, really a, a, a renewed enthusiasm and, and cultural significance. And the irony is that I, you know, I have a wonderful community of documentary filmmakers that I'm part of in Vancouver, and it's a slog. It's an absolute slog. Broadcasters are paying less and less. The field is getting more crowded as technology becomes more accessible. It's, you know, and I, I've spoken to some students before um, who asked me about getting into this world. And I say, you have to have a strong stomach. You have to have family support. That's just full on true. And you have to really love it and figure out a way to do it. That's not going to make you broke and depressed. It's yeah. really tough. Yeah. And it, it's, that seems to apply to so many different um, I was gonna say parts of the arts. So right many now. arts are like that, 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 yeah. that's, the that's, model is broken. That's yeah. With, you know, goes. Spotify yeah. and Amazon clawing, yeah. you know, as much money from both sides, from the artists and the consumers as they possibly can. Yeah. And everybody just expects to get their art for free. Yep. Absolutely. And I think obviously this comes back to technology changing and the models changing and everyone has been, or, or the gatekeepers rather, have been so slow to adapt. And unfortunately, you know, documentary specifically generally attracts, you know, enthusiastic, curious, intellectual, uh, socially engaged, politically engaged, you know, often activist yeah. type folks. Mm -hmm. And they're the folks that are willing to make that bargain, you know, to in order to work in, in, the, in the medium. And I just think, oh, this is such crap. It's such crap. Yeah. So it makes me very sad. And again, that's why I've been very, you know, yes, I still intend to work in documentary. I have another project in development. But long term, I, I don't think this is a, a field that's going to be uh, well sustained in this country, at least until until things fundamentally change. Yeah. What a shame. 
just thank God Mark and I are making so much money with this podcast that. Um, oh yeah, right. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I, I haven't quit my. I, you've retired, but I I still have a day job. Joe, <laughs> I teach journalism, which is a really great thing too. That's another area which is exactly the same things you've said Under about fire. documentary yeah. is true of journalism is, oh, I is know. I the know. industry really preys on the idea that people want to do it and they're willing to sacrifice to do it. And mm -hmm. that's not sustainable. You've got to pay no, people. Not. It's predatory. Anyways. Yeah. I wish everyone who wants to enter this field, the best of luck. I hope they have again, a supportive family and, and a backup plan. But I hope you can so, get enough narrative work that you can then do the occasional side documentary project because you, you yeah. definitely have the touch. You got the talent for it. Well, thank yeah, you. And I, sure. think, I think I always will. I mean, I love, you know, I've always been a, a reader and a, a, I, I read more than I watch films by far. Um, and so that that element of, I think, curiosity. We like to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Two writers. You're, we're fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. And just and just a fascination with history. I think I'll always have a foot in this in this medium. But again, I, I wish I could say it was a sustainable option for, for Canadian filmmakers, but I really don't think it is. Okay, can you tell us a bit about your narrative film aspirations? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, I mean, w what I can talk about is I, I, I have a, um, a television show, a comedy that is currently in development with a wonderful um, Ontario company. I can't talk too much about it, but it's been, um, you know, I do know a number of documentary filmmakers who have made the jump into narrative and scripted directing and it's, 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 it's doable, but it's challenging. And so one of the ways that I've tried to approach that is writing my own material. And so, you know, I have the show that I've written, I'm, hoping that we'll have some, you know, solid updates in the new year. But it's been a real source of pleasure and a real interesting sideways lateral move and an, an opportunity to, from a writing standpoint, to use the skills that I have from documentary, um, especially because my show is based on a sort of fictionalized am amalgamation character of, of actual folks. And so to be able to bring that research background and that, again, curiosity into a writing space and then think about how I'll be directing it um, after is just so much fun. Well, that it does sound like fun. I, yeah, long wanted to be a filmmaker and, uh, but ultimately decided that uh, writing books was uh, cheaper and easier. <laughs> Well, hey, I mean, anyone, anyone could presume, hey. and congratulations on writing books. That's an, an enormous feat. But in terms of being a filmmaker, I mean, that's, I mean, that is the beauty. I keep talking about the technical revolution in sort of negative terms because of the way I, it's impacted the industry. And again, I say this as someone who learned on analog film, like I was the last actually graduating class out, out of SFU that did shoot all my projects on, on super 16 and all of that knowledge was, uh, pretty much nullified by. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like my journalism degree. <laughs> oh, I remember one inch tape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what? Those are just the I tools. Have one inch tape, but I bring this up because, you know, I, th there is benefits to, to the tech um, revolution and anyone can make a film. Anyone can use their smartphone and iMovie and, and come up with something that satisfies them creatively. Will it, necessarily get into a, a film festival if it's good enough potentially but i you know i certainly i i recognize i have a bit of a negative and cynical view on a lot of things but i certainly encourage anyone who who's interested in filmmaking be it documentary or, or narrative script just do it you can you know yeah. don't don't write, don't write an epic uh historical drama set in uh, the southern u.s but, you know, think about what's what's at your disposal and what interests you and what you're passionate about and and how can you make that happen with the the resources at your disposal? Yeah, Fabulous absolutely. advice. Yeah. You're yeah. totally channeling Kurt Vonnegut, one of our favorite writers. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank like, you. And you don't sound uh, you don't strike me as cynical, just uh, practical. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Now, um, and just winding down, I wanted to just to go back to uh, Doug Bennett uh, a little mm -hmm. bit. So part of your film, your documentary was about reconnecting with your childhood best friend, Shay. Have you guys maintained that, that relationship post documentary? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and obviously, it's it's an adult relationship. It's different than, you know, two childhood besties. But I'm so, so happy to say that, yes, we're absolutely still in, in one another's lives. And yeah, it's it's great. It, it feels like things have finally, you know, a, a chapter of my life that hadn't properly 
been addressed has has come to a nice a nice place. So yeah, I'm really happy. It underscores as well the notion that that this this kind of work that you do that we do, it isn't just about uh, seeking success in, in fame or fortune, but it it has other subsidiary benefits, you know, that we don't necessarily anticipate or expect that that come out of them. Other rewards. Oh, absolutely. And that's, again, that's the joy of being, I think, in the arts in any capacity is you can never fully know where something is going to take you. And again, as I mentioned, when I set out to make this film, never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be a character, that Shay would be a character, that my mother would be a character. Hmm. You know, I, I followed the story and I, I responded to encouragement from, again, from John and, and from our broadcaster. And it, it landed you know, in a really special place that had a, a meaningful uh, impact on my life. And I, I hope that any project that I work on has has that that element of, of surprise and, and lasting impact in whatever facet. Mark, any final questions or thoughts? Yeah, just or? back to Kurt Vonnegut. I mean, that's the beauty of doing anything like this <laughs> is that it makes your soul grow. That's the reason we do it. It grows our soul. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I- so, you know, a, a dear friend of mine is, um, you know, she she works a, 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 a traditional job, but she's writing her, she's written her first novel. And uh, we were talking about it last night. And I said, you, give, you ever give yourself goosebumps? And she's like, yeah, I do. And I'm yeah. like, I know. Isn't it cool? She's like, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I'm like, I know. It's great. It's, it's that sort of, you know, indescribable um I, I don't know. I, I know there's lots of words for it, but that, that, that moment where you feel like you're, you're cooking, you know, yeah, that yeah. makes all the late rent payments and the peanut butter toast dinners worthwhile to a point. Right. So that's actually how I know it, a chapter is done. If mm-hmm. I finish a chapter and then reread the chapter and then I get those goosebumps, I'm like, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's one it's scene in the fatness that still makes me laugh. I, I just have to think about it a little bit and it just makes okay. me laugh. I don't know that anyone else finds it that funny, but I sure do. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry to say I'm not familiar with both of your work, but I'm excited to check it out after this great conversation. No obligation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> Teresa, thank you very much for coming on our podcast and talking to us. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. It was lovely to meet you. Yeah, you guys both. Thanks for having me on. You've been listening to Recreative, a podcast about creativity. Talking to creative people from every walk of life about the art that inspires them. And you're probably wondering, how can I support this podcast? I am wondering, Joe, how can I support this podcast? I mean, apart from being on it. There's no advertisements in this podcast. There's no tip jars. There's nothing about like buying us a coffee or anything like that. But there is a way that you can support us. And what is that? It's not about supporting us. It's about supporting the people that we're talking to. I think most of the people we've talked to are artists of some description, and they probably have some kind of artistic product that you could buy. And if you enjoyed it, maybe you could review it for them. Oh, yeah. But maybe us too. Yeah, you know what? Us too. It wouldn't hurt. They could buy our books. And how do they find us? Recreative.ca. Don't forget the hyphen. There's a hyphen in there. Re-creative. I took your line. Sorry. Well, because I stole your line. <laughs> so yes, re-creative.ca. Jinx. Oh yeah, you're, that, I stole your line again. <laughs> As well, if you like what you've just heard, you could consider subscribing to the podcast. And leave a comment if you like it. Thanks for listening. Spread the word. <laughs>